Hey, my name is Joe, and my dad's a rocket scientist. And in today's episode, uh, me and my pop talk about the Big Bang Theory. And we talk about more high-altitude balloon escapades, as well as we sort of gush about uh, (laughs) how awesome Albert Einstein is. So, listen, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Uh, I appreciate you listening. Here we go. Hi, my name's Joe, and uh, my dad is a rocket scientist. So, uh, say hi, Dad. Hi, Dad. So, uh, what what have you been working on this week, Pop? Uh, I've been actually working on looking at the spectrum, meaning the distribution of energy versus distribution of flux. I mean, how bright something was as a function of energy for something called clusters of galaxies in that the galaxies you see on the sky aren't just sort of uniformly spread all over the sky. Lots and lots of them are in groups and they've been sort of sucked into that group by their gravity. And it turns out when that happens, a lot of the gas from all these galaxies gets released and gets really hot and then so hot that it glows in x-rays. So all these individual little galaxies are sort of in this big ball of hot gas. And so looking at it to try to understand, you know, study the gas and... uh, Are you able to like uh, differentiate like different sources, like different stars and stuff like that amongst that sort of big glowing mass? No, it's the galaxies are off too far away to see individual stars in it. You just see, I mean, in the optical, you know, regular old telescopes with visual light, you can see the the galaxies, you can't see this glowing gas. But if you look in X, the X-rays being emitted by it, this hot gas just gives off tons and tons of X-rays and you really don't see the galaxies inside there. Every once in a while for a couple of special of these groups, there is a galaxy in there that is so strong that you can see X-rays coming from it plus from the glowing gas, but that's not usual. And so now what, what are you looking, what sort of data, are you looking at data from a satellite or something like that? Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at all the 16 of these clusters of galaxies that the Rossi X-ray Timing Explorer pointed at and collected data. And so one of the things I measure is what's the temperature of this gas? Because by looking at the spectrum, how many came in at what energy, you can determine how hot this thing was. And you can start to see some of the elements that are in this gas that have been blown out from the galaxy. So you see X-rays coming from iron, and that's all I can see with XTE, but some of the other satellites that are designed much more to see this sort of stuff can see silicon and calcium and all that. And that's sort of confirming that, yeah, all these elements are made in stars and galaxies, and for some of it gets blown out of the galaxy. And, uh, it shows up in this hot gas in that the gas is so hot, it makes the atoms of say iron glow and they glow at a specific energy. So I can see, oh, look at that energy. I got a whole bunch more x-rays than around it and said, okay, that's lets me know how much iron was there. So, and so, yeah. So is it, I mean, is this sort of like miniature little big bangs where no no what we think it's all right the the official astronomy word is outflow so from these galaxies there's gas flowing out it's being driven out of the galaxy and so that's what and it gets into this big ball of hot gas and then the various elements start to the word is fluoresce meaning they get hit by x-rays and then they give off their own x-rays as a result. And uh, by looking at just the right energies, because we know the energies of x-rays that these atoms give off, 
at a certain temperature, we can see, oh, there were this many x-rays coming from it, therefore I can calculate how much iron was there. And we generally compare it to what we see from the sun. And so, because that's real close, and we can study all sorts of stuff with the sun. So you talk about how much iron relative to the amount of iron in the sun, or silicon, or calcium, that what's, sort of stuff. What's okay? So you say all this stuff is sort of getting blown out of it. How? What? What's providing the the momentum? Because I thought, you know, yeah, no gravity in space. Well, is there an explosion? Or yeah, it can be supernova explosions that are going on in the galaxy can blow some of the stuff out there. It can be some processes that in the galaxy that get real hot and that that hot temperature can give these guys enough energy to escape. And this is a big area of study right now because one of the things we want to know is how does this outflow of material affect how the galaxy changes with time. And it's all part of studying the evolution, as we say, of galaxies. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, so... Hmm. So that's what I've been doing. And one other thing I'm, I tried to find evidence for, but turns out I, we didn't have sensitive enough, sensitive enough measurements for it, is that for many of these galaxies, these clusters of galaxies, the, there's electrons also running around there and there's magnetic fields. So the electrons are spiraling around the magnetic field, giving off radio waves. And so here's these radio waves that can be measured by radio telescopes. And that gives us an idea of the how fast the electrons are moving around in there. And so if one of these really fast electrons hits an x-ray, it can knock the x-ray up to much higher energy. You know, like, I mean, it's not true, but like billiards, you know, if you've got a ball sitting there, another one comes in and whacks the other one out to uh, moving. The electrons hit these x-rays and knock them up to higher energies. And so I was looking to see if I could see evidence for that, because also these x-rays can hit the cosmic microwave background, which is the light from the Big Bang that's still rattling around the universe. And okay, if these so let's, let, let's back up then a little bit. Yeah, because back up when, a second. When, Forget when, what I... Yeah. When people talk about the Big Bang, I think the, yep. the common school of thought is, you know, there's nothing, there's a... Something causes this explosion, and we could go... This... Or from a religious perspective of, of God causing it, we could go from a scientific thing of maybe it was just, you know, the universe is constantly expanding and contracting, and when it contracts... Well, the, our universe didn't exist before this happened. Right. And so all of a sudden, there was a tremendous amount of energy released, and the universe, and that made things starting to expand. And that's the Big Bang. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of study going on for that. So so you're saying that w what you were saying before is this, what was the, the, the cosmic background? Wow. Okay, so part of, as I say, the light from this flash okay. that went off is still rattling around the universe. The universe has expanded tremendously since then, and so that causes it to cool this radiations. Think of it sort of like if you have these CO2 fire extinguishers, and when you fire them off, the CO2 coming out is really cold and you don't want to hold the end of the fire extinguisher. It's the same thing. When the universe expands, it you can think of it as it stretched the wavelength of the light going out there. And we can measure that Nowadays, it was one of the great discoveries of the last century that this stuff existed. So, I mean, and are these like essentially like ripples in a pond that are kind of bouncing around? No, no, this is this is light, but it is in the microwave wavelength. It's so it's it's radio waves, but I mean it's a light waves running around whose wavelength is what we would call microwaves. 
it, the length of them. So just like your microwave that you nuke your dinner in, that sort of wavelength of things. And so there are telescopes out there specifically to measure microwaves coming in. And with that was the discovery of these things. Now, if you think this explosion, that should, since it was so hot, everything should just sort of be uniform on the sky. You know, just as many microwaves coming from this direction as that. Okay. And that's, and that's true. To first order. So we, the, there have been ground-based measurements, there have been balloons, and there have been satellites that measure this. And yes, right off, it's perfectly uniform. But then if you start looking at the details, first of all, you can see an effect of hotter and colder ones due to the fact that the Earth is moving ar around, in that the galaxy is rotating that we're in. We're moving around a circle. And that gets into this thing called the Doppler effect, that when things are moving away from us, they look redder, and when they're moving toward us, they look bluer. You can think of it as light gets squished or stretched, as depending on which way it's going. Okay, and so kind of similar, the, the, the sound equivalent would be sort of the, the sound of a, a car approaching versus the sound of a car going away from you, how the, the, the note yeah. changes. Yeah, like NASCAR, you hear them going right. as they go past. It okay, so same frequency. thing with light. Right, and so you can see that. So you can take that effect out in the data analysis. And then what you see is microwaves from the galaxy. You can see the Milky Way, basically. All right, we don't want to know about that. You can take that out in the data analysis. And then what's left over is all these patchy thing places it's not this nice smooth radiation on the sky in all directions it there's some colder spots some hotter spots around and but this is like a 10 millionth of the fraction of the light so you're really getting down having to measure this stuff super accurately and this is answered one of the great questions is if the explosion was so smooth, how did galaxies and stars ever form? Because they would have to be, you know, if everything was smooth. Why would they ever get together in a spot here and a spot there and a spot there? That would create enough gravity that, to sort of bring those pull the things stuff together. To get, right. And so the fact that they saw the microwave background give indications that there were spots of high and low on the sky then lets us try to understand how that that's the way uh, galaxies came about is that the matter fell into the holes, so to speak. And this then lets you say, oh, I can study a lot about the very early part of the universe by studying this microwave background in tremendous detail. And there's a lot of folks doing that. People at UCSD are doing that. And they are putting in telescopes on the Atacama Desert up in uh, Chile, 17,000 feet to get above water and all this, which would mess up their observations. There are other observations made from the South Pole, which is also very dry, and they can do it there. So people are trying to learn about all this stuff of the microwave background. So this stuff is running around, getting back to the clusters of galaxies. The electrons that are whipping around the magnetic fields in these clusters can hit the microwave background and knock it up to real high energies, to like almost gamma ray energies, very high energy. So one of the things I was looking for in my data is could I see evidence for this extra amount of X-rays coming out, not just from the hot gas, but also from the cosmic microwave background being knocked up to higher energies? And the answer was no. I couldn't see it. My data wasn't sensitive enough, but it was a nice try. Interesting. Okay. And so is sort of the next step on that is trying to piggyback your data off of another satellite or another detector's data? Well, you just have to get someone, some of these instruments that are more sensitive. And there is one up there uh, called NuSTAR. It's a Caltech 
mission. And they have much more sensitive detectors that do go in the same energy range as the RXTE, the Ross X-ray Timing Explorer data. But they are a focusing telescope, so they can be much more sensitive. And one could, if you can talk uh, the folks into looking at it, take long looks at certain clusters to see if you can see that extra amount. And so far, I, no one has claimed it really, but that would be the way to do it. You have to have much more sensitive instruments. So, okay, so sort of jump on a tangent here real quick. Focusing a telescope on, that's okay. on a satellite. Yeah, so let's just what, think on, of an, on average, how long of like an exposure are we talking? Are we talking, you know, minutes, days, hours? Okay, first let's say that we're talking about x-rays. Right. How do you focus x-rays? I mean, x-rays go through things. So if you had a mirror there, it just either go through the mirror or get absorbed in it. It's not going to bounce off and make a nice image. But it turns out people realized that it actually will bounce off the mirror if it comes in at a very shallow angle to the mirror, you know, a grazing incidence, it's called. So it's coming in almost parallel to the mirror, hits it, and then it will be uh, reflected, say, down. And so if you build those mirrors right, you can get an image. But it has a very long focal length. That is, the distance from the mirror to where it all comes to a nice image is pretty far away. And so <clears throat> some of the missions that use it, such as Chandra and XMM, they uh, have are very long. And New Star is the same way, except New Star Special. The Chandran and XMM satellites, which are really great ones, but they specialize in looking at sort of lower energy x-rays than I'm interested in. They go from about a tenth of a kilo electron volt up to 10 kilo electron volts. That's just how we measure energy. Instead of saying wavelength, we say energy. The new star ones, though, they found a way to put a special set of layers on the mirrors that gives them better reflectivity at higher energies. So they can go up to 70,000, 70, yeah, thousand electron volts, 70 kilo electron volts. So they can focus them much easier. But the focal length is, I forget, it's something, and what, 13 meters or something like that, a really long focal length. So to launch this thing, they had to launch it compressed. And once it got in orbit, they sent a command and it expanded to its full length. And uh, so kind that's of really like sort accordioned of, out. Yeah, you can think of that. It's uh, it's actually made out of essentially those rods you use in camping tents that you fold all up. And if you let them go, they spring out to make your tent full size. Right. Well, they wrap those guys all up and when they release it, they expand and make the detectors move away from the mirrors and get to the right distance away to make an image. Wow. And there, therefore, since it makes an image, their detectors can be small. And if their detectors are small, they have much less noise in them, background counts. And the fact that these detectors also let you know where on the detector the X-ray hit, that lets them be even more sensitive. And so those guys, that's the way to do it. But, you know. But I mean, but once again, you're, you're in essence, you're focusing on something that's... Yeah, you, you, you point know, at something. That's you billions know. of miles yeah. away. Right. And, and so the question is, how bright is this thing? Because the how bright it is tells you how many x-rays you're going to get per second, let's say. And then you can calculate to measure something as accurately as I want. I need to get this many x-rays, all right? If they're coming in at, I don't know, 10 a second, how long do you have to wait to get the million of them, let's say, that you needed to do your measurement accurately? That's what sets how long you look at something. That's 
I'm I'm still trying to figure out. You're you're focusing on something that's really far away, but also the satellite itself is moving. Oh yeah, the universe, the Milky Way itself is moving, and so I'm just yeah, trying oh, to figure the, out how you, you focus. You don't have to worry about the Milky Way part. It's during our during say a day worth of looking, it, you can't tell that. It, okay. what, that won't mess anything up. You know, but that going around the Earth, absolutely. So what they do is they just have the satellite point right at the thing you want. And as it goes around, it keeps pointing at it. It doesn't change that point. And depending on where in the sky you're looking, it may be that the telescope then goes behind the Earth and gets the Earth gets in the way. Okay, that's part of what you have to throw into your calculation of, okay, a third of the time the Earth's going to be in the way. i got to add more time to get my million x-rays or whatever you need. I got you. So it's really, it's not like the, the satellite's going to have to be constantly sort of doing these micro adjustments. It really is. You just set it and forget it. Well, no, the onboard system makes sure that it stays pointed at exactly the direction it's been told. Okay. And there are spinning wheels like gyroscopes on it that help it stay pointed at exactly the right spot. And so it really does, if you look at teeny tiny detail, yeah, it moves around a little bit, but it's not enough to mess up your picture. Okay. Very cool. Neat. So yeah. we were the other day talking about gravity waves. Mm-hmm. What's the, okay. the, those sound very like Star Trek y, sci fi y, and not something that's real? Yeah, it's really sort of weird. In that Einstein's theory of relativity, the major change he made was that matter changes the shape of space. And I was thinking about it. the way you can think about it is you've got a trampoline in your backyard, right? All nice right. and flat. You go out and stand in the middle of it, you depress it. Well, that's sort of how space gets, the shape gets changed because say there's a planet or a star there, it, there's a depression. And let's say then your kid comes along and rolls a ball on the trampoline. It's gonna go around and around, but it's gonna eventually end up down by your feet in that it's gonna eventually fall down into that hole in space or that depression. But isn't and that more though gravity the that same, causes that? that? That is gravity. Ah, okay. Gravity is sort of the shape of space due to massive or due to objects of any mass, except, you know, you and I probably wouldn't make hardly any dent at all in it that you could measure, but the sun makes a dent so that one of the Einstein predictions was starlight passing close to the sun would be deflected slightly. Its path would change. And if you think about it, if something's coming along and then goes around the edge of that hole, it's going to sort of fall in a little bit as it goes past. And that's the changing of the direction of starlight. And that was measured. And by golly, it's right what Einstein said it would be. That's just... Okay, so yeah. how wh when was... How long ago was Einstein around? He he died what in like the the seventies? I think fifties. I okay. thought, but I'm not sure. All right. And but all this stuff he did was you know in the nineteen late nineteen tens, early nineteen twenties. That era. That is incredible. Okay. Yeah. So all right. So back to the the gravity waves. Okay. So now, what if you have two objects that are close to each other going around each other? you know, sort of spinning around the sides of this depression. Okay. That means there's gonna, they're going to make their own depressions. Right. So, so think about the so, person standing in the middle of a trampoline and, like, two bowling balls. Yeah. Okay. And that, that's, But that's going to change the shape of the trampoline surface as they go around. Right. And so that's what happens in space. If you have two objects, say two black holes running around each other. They're cha constantly changing the shape of space, putting ripples out. And those ripples go out, like when you throw the rock in the pond and it makes the ripples go out. And so there was this magnificent instrument called LIGO 
the Laser Interferometer Gravity Observatory or Gravitational Observatory, something like that, that was made, developed over 30 or 40 years. It took a long time to get it sensitive enough to see these ripples as they go past the Earth. And so they just what, a year ago, a little more than a year ago, they first had were able to measure this in that they were finally sensitive enough to see a set of these ripples go by. So, and I mean, it seems like it, they're almost, they have the theory, but they don't have the technology to measure the theory, and we're just sort of constantly playing catch-up, I guess. Yeah, and with LIGO, we now are starting to have the technology to test the various theories. I mean, that's because, like Nobel Prize kind of stuff, oh, right? They that's And they just got it. Kip Thorne and the other guys who were in charge, who pioneered this and pushed it forward, they just got the Nobel Prize. Oh, okay. So, the but then it gets into, all right, as these, say, two black holes, that was the first thing they discovered, go around each other, they're slowly spiraling in to each other, and they're going faster and faster and faster, and then they come together as a black hole and give off a bunch of energy, gra gravitational energy. So this LIGO system started to see wiggles and the wiggles were getting closer and closer and closer and then, and they could measure all this and compare it to their theories and said, all right, here were two black holes, one, I forget the exact numbers, one 50 solar mass times the mass of the sun, the other 30 or something like that. And they came together and formed a new black hole of a certain size and that a certain amount of energy was given off gravitational waves, more of them. And that's all they could measure that in LIGO. And so now the theoreticians have to say, oh, OK, now my theory had better be able to predict the right numbers for this. And they're still working on the theory of I mean, they've done a lot of work, but the details of two black holes coming together can be very intimidating. So, uh, but that's what LIGO measured. And to give you an idea how hard this is, what LIGO is, is it has two arms, they're called, it's two pipes going off at 90 degrees from each other. And inside those pipes, there's a laser beam going down each one and hitting mirrors and coming back. And by when, if they have it set just right, when the two waves of laser light come back together, they absolutely cancel each other and you don't see anything. So they but, sort of create a little wobble for a split second. Well, no, I mean, they, they should see nothing. It's like, I don't know, you've seen surfing when a guy's coming in, but one of the waves from the shore is going out right. and it cancels the wave they're sitting on and all of a sudden they're three feet in the air with no wave under them. Right. This is set up to be that, okay, when nothing's going on, the two waves come together and absolutely cancel each other. But then if one arm gets a little bit longer than the other or a little bit shorter, then they're not going to exactly cancel and you'll see a signal, a teeny tiny one. And so this is what LIGO measures because when a gravity wave comes along, it will shrink one arm and lengthen the other or a combination of the two. To, and that's the signal they look for. The amount so bizarre. Oh, it's even worse than that. The amount that they change in length yeah. is a millionth of the diameter of a proton. Okay. Tiny. So yeah. So 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 Tiny. we're talking okay. So A we're but not they can measure it. This is yeah. this is what took thirty or forty years is to get the technology so that, so that the they could measure that big a change or that small a change in a mirror distance. I uh, how do you, I don't even, how would you go about, I mean, I'm assuming it's all, all with lasers. Yeah, it's this one, yeah, there's a one laser, there's a mirror that splits it into two beams, right. one going down each yeah. leg of this thing. But just somehow it, they're able to measure those changes. Yeah, by seeing how much when they come back together, is there a small amount left over such that they didn't cancel out perfectly? Right. It's that amount, and then you watch how that little amount changes in time, and that tells them about the ripples going by. 
Okay, so these these ripples, I'm I'm guessing they're once again that super crazy fraction of a secondy sort of thing, not like you know a half hour. Well, type of ripple. They do they do start out. I mean, it all it's as these two black holes are spiraling around each other. There's a certain amount of time for them to go around once. And then as they get closer and closer, that time gets shorter and shorter. Right, they so speed the up. number of waves coming by becomes more and more. And so that's what they were able to measure and see it. I think they've done it for about five of these events so far. But the one that also has generated a lot of excitement is there's another cinder that's left after a large star, supernovas, and that's called a neutron star. And it's not as big and heavy as a black hole. It, they're generally about as heavy as the sun. But so they're not going to make as big a ripples, but they go around a lot faster. And so they finally, they were lucky and they saw one that they were able to see it come in and the, the time between it get shorter and shorter and shorter. And then they lost their sensitivity to it. But they saw this thing happen. And so now they have information on two neutron stars merging together. And then they, the theoreticians have to get all their theories going right to get the right numbers for two neutron stars coming together. But uh, the interesting thing with this is when they come together, there's a lot of material blown apart because of the interaction. Like, like and physically it, chunks flying off into space kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. or or gazillions of atoms, okay, nuclei going out into space, and this uh, and they are thought to have since it's neutron stars, meaning there's lots of neutrons involved. One of the ways the elements are made is neutrons hitting a, a nucleus and making it a new element, and then another nucleus, another neutron hits it and make it even another element, and that. Maybe a large fraction of the elements in the sky, elements like uranium and gold and all these really big, heavy ones, are made when these neutron stars come together. It used to be thought that they were made in the explosions of stars in the supernova. And I used to tell you that, oh, the gold in my ring came from a star blowing up or stars blowing up. Now it's looking like more of it came from these neutron star, neutron star mergers. And this is a really active area right now that people are looking into. So that also says we really want to know how many times do these neutron star, neutron star mergers occur? Because that'll give us an idea of how much gold and uranium is being made. And does that make sense with other measurements that have been made? And so... Now LIGO, they're working real hard to get it about three times more sensitive because they, the one neutron star merger they saw, they were really lucky because it was really sort of pretty close, which really isn't close, but right. I mean, it was. And so with this, when they're more sensitive, they'll be able to see the same sort of thing, but from further away. And they hope to then maybe, who knows, get one of these a month one a week, one a year, who knows, but that's going to start to tell us how often these things come together. And then the guys can go calculate, all right, you know, does this make sense for the amount of uranium and gold we see either in the cosmic rays or in meteorites or wherever they measure it? I mean, what, what I'm hearing is that really the end game is we're going to start uh, manipulating neutron stars to collide to create, you know, gold. That, that's right. That, that's what I'm hearing. You know, yeah. diamonds. Except, except we have no control over it. Ah. We are not manipulating. We're just hoping enough of them are doing it that we can see lots of them with LIGO. But who knows? Nature always, you know, what's the old line? If you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Right. Well, you know, we'll have to see when LIGO gets even more sensitive. And it, and so there's two LIGO institution setups in the United States, one in Washington State, one in Louisiana. And one of the ways they make sure it's a real event is both of them have to see it, you know, at the right times. There is also one in Europe, Virgo, 
And but are they also sort of seeing it on super on slightly delayed time? Sure, Be- and that and able to and position that led- it be- through that. Yeah, and with that triangulation, you sort of get a spot on the sky, and maybe it was the neutron star one that. One of the things is it wasn't seen by this Virgo one, but Virgo can only see certain parts of the sky at any one time. It couldn't see this one area where the other two said, oh, it's up in that area. So that let them further confirm that, yep, that's the right area. And they made the spot on the sky where it came from smaller. And then all the other telescopes in the world, the ones in orbit and the ones on the ground, looked at that spot in the sky and they've, there was a galaxy that all of a sudden had something getting bright in it. So then they knew what galaxy this thing came from. And they're still watching it to this day. And it, the, you can think of it as the glowing hunk of matter out there is getting brighter and brighter. So maybe that means there's a beam of this stuff. And anyway, it's a great area of scientific endeavor for us astro, astrophysics types. That is super cool. So, I mean, other than just the pure sort of science, what's the, the, the benefit to people on Earth for that sort of knowledge? Well, all of astronomy, I mean, the benefit, other than getting some technologies that might help people for various other things, it's understanding the universe we live in. How did it come about? How is it evolving? Where is it going? How did all the chemicals come about? Where'd the gold in your wedding ring come from? Where'd the uranium, you know, in the nuclear power plants come from? You know, where all this other, all these other elements, trying to understand where what's going on. And this is basic research. It's basic understanding of the universe around us. And if you want to get a little bit into more religious ideas, you could think of all this stuff going on is just God's plan for how to do it. And we are trying to understand God's plan. If you want to look at it from a more religious point of view. Wow. That is, that's deep, man. All right. So, Oh yeah. So let's, uh, all right, let's, let's take it up a, a notch or two. And the last time we talked, we, uh, you were talking about some uh, high altitude balloon mishaps and just sort oh, of yeah. all those those fun things that happened. One yeah. of the things that I remember telling you telling stories about was there was something involving like a farmhouse in South America or something like that. Okay, one years ago, where one of the ideas is you want the balloon to stay up high long long enough for you to get the amount of time you need to make a certain measurement and if you launch them in the united states except if you launch it at certain times of the year the winds blow it towards the ocean one way or the other and you only have a certain amount of time you can look so nasa had worked on developing what they called long duration ballooning and that was launch it from alice springs australia and have it go around the world if the balloon would make it. And, and now then, these these balloons are like the size of what? Football fields. Okay. Maybe a, depending on how heavy the thing they're carrying, it could be three football fields. Okay. But that's the biggest ones I know of. All right. But they also have to be special because they're made out of very thin plastic, sort of like the plastic you get around your clothes from the dry cleaner. And what happens is they're filled with helium, but helium can sneak through that thin plastic. It slowly goes through it. So it you know, the balloon loses its lift, you can think of it, with time. And so they've tried to come up with either thicker pieces of plastic or a way to keep them pressurized more. So we were part of this a long time ago, and they launched from Alice Springs, And after a day or two, something on the balloon died. The transmitter or the power supply or something died. And NASA said, naturally, well, cut it down as soon as you can to save it. Well, 
at that time, it was over Angola in Africa. And that's when there was a, a minor war going on there with Cuban troops and all that sort of thing. And we were saying, oh, yeah, cut it down in Angola and say, time out. Oh, yes, we're Americans and it dropped from the sky. But don't worry, it doesn't mean anything. Fortunately, before the decision could be made, it was out over the Atlantic Ocean. So, OK, it goes to Brazil. And the NASA team and our representative are there in a chase plane. And in the morning, as the, you can see the balloon, it's this really bright speck in the sky reflecting all the light from the sun. You can see it. And then they had to decide, all right, when do we tell it to come down? And it was a real cloudy day, so they couldn't see the ground. And they and didn't have by, G by come GPS. Down, by come down, it's not just, you know, slowly let out air of the balloon? No, it, no the, the instrument package is hanging from a parachute. And the parachute is connected to the balloon. And so you send a signal that basically says, let go of the parachute. It's a little explosive device pops and it releases the parachute. Okay. Okay. And so all of a sudden there was the story I was told there was a clearing and they could see like three lakes and they looked on the map. Oh yeah, yeah, we're out in the middle of nowhere. Send the command. And they did. And so now it's coming down on the parachute and the chase plane is circling it, going around the payload at a distance, but going around it. And our guy had a video camera and he's videoing this. And so when you do that, he's aiming it always at the balloon, at the package on the parachute. So the land is spinning around it in the image because the airplane's going around the object. And you see fields and forests and lakes and soccer stadiums and high rise condominiums. Uh -oh. Turns out it was the wrong three lakes. <laughs> All right. And it, came, and it came down and landed on a roof of a house in a small town in Brazil. I forget the name of the town. It didn't break through the roof. It just landed on it. Yeah, the parachute shroud lines did short circuit the power to the city for a little while when it hit the power lines. But other than that, other than that. so our guys land the plane and get there. The NASA guy is dying. He has never released it wrong. He's never hit anybody. It's always been safe. He's going nuts. So our guys get there and our guys go up and turn, undo the batteries and all this. Well, as I told you, NASA, the balloon guys carry money with them to, in case they have to knock down a farmer's fence to go get it, they can pay the farm. Well, they gave the owner of the house a certain amount of money and he was very happy with the amount of money. And so that everybody's happy that way. But it was a slow news day. And in those days, the Russian, what, newspaper or whatever, TASS had reporters around the world. So the Russian reporters were out there asking the NASA representative if that was the house he meant to hit. Oh, man. <laughs> and he's going, no, no, he's still dying. Well, how often do you hit houses? You know, it was a slow news day, but it all turned out fine. The man whose house it hit was fine. They got it off. We, Our guy who was videoing it did, he had to go unhook the batteries. So he gave his camera to, I don't know, some 12 or 14 year old kid who was staying there said, keep shooting me while I go do this. And the kid did. Of course, there was about a minute of a young girl posing in the for the camera and all that. But uh, yeah, oh, that's great. Thing, things like that happen. That is great. Yeah, I guess it's always sort of, you're really, I guess, pushing the limits of science and technology and all that stuff, you know, accidents and the unknown yeah. is going to happen. Yeah, but let me point out, NASA is really, really conscious about this. So it used to be launches came from Palestine, Texas. That's where one of the big balloon setups is. But it turns out part of Palestine, Texas got built up on one side. So if the wind is blowing in that direction, they won't launch balloons in that direction because if something happened, it would hit houses. In the other direction, there still aren't enough houses to worry about it. A lot of the balloon flights from the U.S. now go from Fort Sumter, New Mexico, Fort Sumter, New Mexico, because there isn't many houses and stuff, and you can launch in both directions. But they're very, very careful. I think they're 
metric is, you know, there's one in a million chance or one in 10 million, whatever it is, chance of hitting a house or hurting anyone. So they're, you know, yes, these things happen, but NASA is really very aware of this stuff and takes it very seriously. Now, is that is that one of the reasons why they do a lot of those high-altitude high balloon launches from um, McMurdo up in, what is that? Is that yeah, South Antarctica? Pole. Oh, no, South Antarctica. Pole. No, Antarctica. Okay. You're right. McMurdo's down by the ocean. Uh, yes, that's one reason. But another reason is they do it in December, and that's when the sun doesn't set. It's the land of the midnight sun, but down in the southern hemisphere. The sun doesn't set at all. It's And therefore, when the balloon is up there, it doesn't cool, which it would at nighttime, and drop to lower altitudes because it becomes less expanded. It cools. So the balloon stays up at your height for a long time. And there the winds make the balloon go around the poles. You know, it just goes around in a circle. And so it takes about, I don't know, two weeks to come around back to over McMurdo. And so this gives very long balloon observations, which is what we want to get our million counts or whatever it is for what we're doing. And so that's why the main reason they go down there is is for the long duration balloons going around the pole. And now recently, NASA is back to, okay, we want long duration ballooning, but launching, say, from Alice Springs, Australia. And they've got a new kind of balloon that will do that. And so uh, a Berkeley instrument that's now at UCSD was part of that. They were maybe the second flight. And it did go around the world, and it stalled over the ocean for a while and then went on. And anyway, it ended up coming down like 46 days later in Peru. And and they were able to recover it. So that gave them a tremendous amount of time to get the data they needed, the enough counts, as you would say, for the subjects, the targets they were looking at. And so this is another way, you know, NASA is working on developing this balloon flight stuff because balloon flights are much, much cheaper than satellites. So for certain kinds of investigations, you can do it just fine if you can just be in a balloon for 40 days up at high altitudes. Okay, yeah, so that's the, I was going to say, because how will, with, uh, with Elon Musk and his, with SpaceX and trying to lower the, the cost for mm -hmm. sending stuff into orbit, I assume someday the hope is, what, we won't have to do high altitude ballooning? If the cost no, I, comes down low enough? I don't know. I don't think it'll ever be low enough because just building the satellite itself. Okay. You know, yes, the rocket launch might only, and I'm totally pulling numbers out of the air now, might only be 30 million instead of 60 million or whatever right. the numbers are. But actually building the satellite itself will still be ex relatively expensive. So the you satellite know. that satellites that get launched into space versus ones on a high altitude balloon are sort of yeah. significantly more complex. Oh yeah, because you can't ever touch them, and they have to work for whatever their specified side length of time is. The balloon ones, you can actually touch it. Grad students can work on it with screwdrivers, and you may even see some duct tape every once in a while on these things. Yes, some of them cost maybe $10 million over many years to get it built up, but that's nothing compared to satellite things that are, I don't know, each instrument on a satellite might cost $30 million all by itself. And then you know? those, those high-altitude balloon, the detectors or the satellites in them, it's basically just a, a super roll cage, right, right. that goes around them. Right, and they'll have solar panels on them since they're going for multiple days and the batteries wouldn't last without being recharged. And they have GPS antennas on them and radio stuff to send the data to the ground. And yeah, it has all this stuff, but it doesn't have to be the super duper really expensive stuff that is high reliability, very high reliability that goes into space. 
So yeah, most of these balloon projects you can do cheaper and uh, yeah, it's much better. If you have a focused, no pun intended, but a focused objective, okay, I want to study, I don't know, the center, gamma rays from the center of the galaxy. And I don't want to go look all over the sky and get all sorts of great other stuff that a satellite project would need to do. You can just have your balloon flight just stare at the center of the galaxy for the 40 days and come down. So it's a single scientific goal, but and therefore it's cheaper. You couldn't ever get a satellite that says, oh, all I want to do is just stare at the center of the galaxy. There wouldn't be enough science for the amount of money that goes into it. I gotcha. All right, cool. Well, anything else? Any 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 stuff uh, cool happen in the uh, in the rocket scientist world this week that you're aware of? I know Elon is shooting uh, off more rockets. Yeah, I saw his launch Thursday of just the Falcon Nine out of Vandenberg. I saw it on the webcast. And I think didn't and that, it also was neat. launch launch a couple of like test communication satellites? I think that that's what they said that they were going to do that. And but you didn't get to see it because once it got up there, right after it released the main satellite, it got out of uh, range for the radio for the ground based antennas to see it. It went over the horizon. Oh, okay. And so they you didn't see any more than that. But I assume both of these two test satellites uh, went out also. So cool. And, yeah. And unfortunately, in that mode, they couldn't recover the booster just the way it went there would never be enough fuel to bring it back to wherever they wanted to bring it back to oh okay i got you it w so it, it had one of those the super return to earthy well ones. it didn't it didn't because they knew they couldn't return it oh, okay so they didn't so it, use that kind of boost i mean it was the same it was uh, the same no absolutely the same booster they okay. just never computered it you know, programmed it to come back because right, they knew it couldn't make it back. There All wouldn't right, be enough fuel. Yeah, I did hear the, I did read though, that they were going to try and recover the nose cone, the fairings that go around the satellite to protect it as it's going up through the atmosphere. And I don't know if that turned out or not, but I was that the thing up. where they were going to try to catch it with like a big net on a boat. Could be. But I think I saw something I, I had, like that. That uh, that totally could be wrong, but. Yeah, it was like a I don't big... know about catching it. They may go fish it go out fish of the water. Out. But... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess you don't want a, something like that just falling anywhere near you if you're on a boat. I think it would go through the net, but <laughs> who knows? <laughs> you're probably right. Fake news. Yeah, no. Fake news. Yeah. All right. There you go. Anything well, else, the, Pop? Yeah. One of the things is there are a bunch of X-ray detectors in orbit that look for something to suddenly show up in the sky. Okay. Because that X-ray sources do that, and there's one that just went off recently, and there have been all sorts of observations, and they're trying to, they decide is this a neutron star going around a regular star, or is it a black hole going around a regular star? And I've been watching the announcements of various observations and stuff, and they're sort of arguing back and forth and back and forth, and what kind of star could it be going around? So it's sort of fun to see. One, oh yes, it's absolutely a neutron star. Another one, ah, eh, wait a minute, you know, it's we think it's a black hole because of this. So that's sort of the the fun of this thing is really trying to find out what's it's is going on and nailing it and showing no 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 it you you had a nice idea but it really doesn't fit into our observations and the other saying well I can interpret your observations a little differently so it's just. It's part of the give and take in science that eventually ends up with a good result explanation because you have hashed out all the possibilities and stuff like that. Dude, and go uh, going back to Einstein. I mean, we're, he that guy had to be so much. I don't know. We need to give him a whole lot more credit. He already gets a ton of credit for being like super super smart, but the fact that we're just now. We're still finally proving stuff that he said was true without the yeah. ability to actually, you know, prove it. He said, oh, yeah, this is this is how well, it is. He, Just trust me. 
He's well, he's a theoretician. He makes predictions for his theory. And that's our job is when we hear about some prediction, we say, oh, can I make measurements to test that theory? And if you can, you try to do that and say, yep, boy, it fits his theory. It doesn't prove his theory. We can't prove any theories, but we can say, oh, sorry, the data doesn't match what you predicted. You've got something wrong with your theory. So we can disprove aspects of the theory. We can't prove them. We can just say, yep, it still seems to fit. Too and, cool. But the part that always gets me about Einstein is, yeah, he had some help, but he went and presented this stuff all by himself. It was his idea. It wasn't the result of a group, you know, at MIT or Caltech or something like that coming up with it. It's just him all by himself. And to have the guts to then say, oh, you know, I really think this is right and important and publish it just as himself. That's amazing. Hey, you're amazing, Pop. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on that note, hey, thank you, Dad, for uh, taking the time to talk to me tonight. Right, and I'm glad I was able to catch myself as when I was earlier talking about the electrons spiraling around the magnetic fields knocking X-rays to higher energy. Yeah, they might do that, but it's the knocking the cosmic microwave background photons to higher energy that I was looking for. Ah, I got there a little you go. Correct. I got a little I got a little excited. All right. Well, your your correction is uh, is noted. <laughs> All right. Well, I will uh, I will talk with you later, Pop. Okay, doke. Thanks a lot. All right. Bye. Bye. Well, that about does it. Thank you very much for listening. Once again, thanks a lot, Dad, for participating in this. I'm going to look into a little bit more Einstein facts because that dude, I don't know, that dude may be cooler than we think. Or he just had just a butt ton of uh, theories and stuff, and we're just sort of cherry picking all the ones he got right. Kind of like a, who was it, Nostradamus. Anyways, thanks a lot for listening. Subscribe, visit the website. Hey, if you have a question about something uh, astronomy based, shoot an email to info at my dad a rocket scientist.com my dad the rocket scientist.com whatever it is uh, or visit the website uh, there's a form on there submit a question I'm sure he'd love to uh, answer questions about heavenly bodies and all sorts of stuff like that thanks a lot see you